what does, according to general relativity, does uh, objects with mass do to the space-time? Right, exactly. So Einstein struggled for this completely general theory, not a specific solution like a black hole or an expanding space-time or galaxies make lenses. or Those are all solutions. That's why what he did was so enormous. It's an entire paradigm that says, over here is matter and energy. I'm going to call that the right-hand side of the equation. <laughs> Everything on the right-hand side of Einstein's equations is how matter and energy are distributed in space-time. On the left-hand side tells you how space and time deform in response to that matter and energy. And it can be impossible to solve some of those equations. What was so amazing about what Schwarzschild did is he found this very elegant, simple solution within like a month <laughs> of reading um, this final formulation. But Einstein didn't go through and try to find all the solutions. He sort of gave it to us right? He shared this, and then lots of people since have been scrambling to try to, ah, I can predict the curvature of the space-time if I tell you how the matter and energy is laid out. If it's all compact in a spherical system like a sun or even a black hole, I can understand the curves in the space-time around it. I can solve for the, for the shape of the space-time. I can also say, well, what if the universe is full of gas or light and it's all kind of uniform everywhere and I'll find a different and equally surprising solution, which is that the universe would expand in response to that, that it's not static, that the distances between galaxies would grow. This was a huge surprise to Einstein. Um, so all of these consequences of his theory, you know, came with revelations <laughs> that were not at all obvious when he first wrote down um, the general theory. And he was afraid to take the consequences of that theory seriously, which is a... Often. I mean, the theory itself in its scope and grandeur and power is scary, so I can mm -hmm. understand. Mm -hmm. Then there's, you know, the the edges of the theory where it falls apart, the consequences of the theory that mm -hmm. are extreme. It's hard to take seriously. Mm -hmm. So you can sort yeah. of empathize. Yeah, he very much resisted the expansion. So if you think about 1905, when he's writing these sequence of unbelievable papers as a 25-year-old who can't get a job you know, as a physicist, and he writes all of these remarkable papers on relativity and quantum mechanics. Um, and then even in 1915-16, he does not know that there are other galaxies out there. This, this was not known. People had mused about it. Um, there were these kind of smudges on the sky that people contemplated. What if there are other island universes? You know, going back to Kant, thought about this. But it wasn't until Hubble, it really wasn't until the late 20s, um, that it's confirmed that there are other galaxies. Wow. Yeah. And he didn't, obviously, <laughs> there's so much we think of now that he didn't think of. So there's no Big Bang. Right. Static universe. Mm, but these are all connected. Wow. Yeah. So he's operating on very little information. Very little information. That's absolutely true. Actually, one of the things I like to point out is the idea of relativity was foisted on people in this kind of cultural way. But there's many ways in which you could call it a theory of absolutism. <laughs> and um, the way Einstein got there with so little information um, is by adhering to certain very strict absolutes, like the absolute limit of the speed of light and the absolute constancy of the speed of light, which was completely bizarre when it was first uh, discovered, really. That was observed. There were experiments trying to figure out um, you know, what would the relative speed of light be. It's the only, it's really, only massless particles have this property, that they have an absolute speed. And if you think about it, it's incredibly strange. Yeah, it's really incredibly strange. Incredibly strange. And then so, yeah. so from, from a theoretical perspective, he... He's, he takes that seriously. He takes it very seriously, and everyone else is trying to come up with models to make it go away, <laughs> yeah. um, to make uh, the speed of light be a little bit more reasonable, like everything else in the universe. Um, you know, if I run at a car, two cars coming at each other, they're coming at each other faster than if one of them stops. It's really a basic observation of reality, right? Here, this is saying that if I'm racing at a light beam um, and you're standing still relative to the source, uh, we'll measure the same exact speed of light. Very strange. 
And he gets to relativity by saying, well, what speed? Speed is distance, it's space, over time. It's how far you travel, um, it's the space you travel in a certain duration of time. And he said, well, I bet something must be wrong then with space and time. So this is an enormous leap. He's willing to give up the absolute character of space and time in favor of keeping the speed of light constant. How was he able to intuit a world of curved space-time? Like, mm, I, I think yeah. it's like one of the most oh special gosh. leaps yeah. in human history, right? Because you're- It's amazing. <laughs> like it's very, very, very difficult to make that kind of leap. I'll, I'll tell you, it took me, I think, a long time to, I can't say this is how he got there exactly. It's not as though I studied the historical accounts or, or his description of his internal states. This is more having learned the subject, how I try to tell people how to get there in a few short steps. Um, one is to start with the equivalence principle, which he called the happiest thought of his life. <laughs> <laughs> and the equivalence principle comes pretty early on in his thinking. And, and um, it starts with something like this. Like right now, I think I'm feeling gravity because I'm sitting in this chair and I feel the pressure of the chair and it's stopping me from falling. And um, I lie down in a bed and I feel heavy on the bed. And I think of that as gravity. And Einstein has a beautiful ability to remove all of these extraneous factors, including atoms. So let's imagine instead that you're in an elevator and you feel heavy on your feet because the floor of the elevator is resisting your fall. But I want to remove the elevator. What does the elevator have to do with fundamental properties of gravity? So I cut the cable. Now I'm falling, but the elevator is falling at the same rate as me. So now I'm floating in the elevator. And if this happened to me, if I woke up in this state of falling or floating in the elevator, I might not know if I was in empty space, just floating, um, or if I was falling around the earth. There would actually, they're equivalent situations. I would not be able to tell the difference. I'm actually, when I get rid of the elevator in this way by cutting the cable, I'm actually experiencing weightlessness. And that weightlessness is the purest experience of gravity. And, um, and so this idea of falling is actually fundamental. It's how we talk about it all the time. The earth is in a free fall around the sun. It's actually falling. It's not firing engines, right? It's just it's just falling all the time, but it's just cruising so fast. So actually, yeah, oh God, you said so many profound things. <laughs> so w one of them is really one of the ways to experience space-time is to be falling. To be falling. That is the purest experience of gravity. The experience of gravity, uh, unfettered, uninterrupted by atoms, <laughs> is weightlessness. Yeah. That observation, no, it has an unhappy ending, the elevator story, <laughs> yeah. right? Because of atoms again. That's the fault of the atoms in your body interacting electromagnetically with the crust of the earth or the bottom of the building or whatever it is. Um, but this period of free fall, so the first observation is that that is the purest experience of gravity. Now I can convince you that things fall along curved paths because I could take uh, you know, a pen and if I throw it, <laughs> we both know it's gonna follow an arc mm -hmm. and it's gonna follow an arc until atoms interfere again and it hits the ground. Mm -hmm. But while it's in free fall, experiencing gravity at its purest, what the Einsteinian description would say is it is following the natural curve in space-time, inscribed by the Earth. So the Earth's mass and shape curves the paths in space, and then those curvatures tell you how to fall, the paths along which you should fall when you're falling freely. And so the Earth has found itself on a free fall that happens to be a closed circle, but it's it's actually falling. The International Space Station uses this principle all the time. They get the space station up there, and then they turn off the engines. Can you imagine how expensive it would be if they had to fuel that thing at all times, right? They turn off the engines. They're just falling. Yeah, they're falling. And they're not that far up. Um, there, there are certainly people sometimes say, oh, they're so far away, they don't feel gravity. Oh, absolutely. If you stopped the space station, it's going like 
17,500 miles an hour, something like that. If you were to stop that, it would drop like a stone right to the earth. <laughs> so they're in a state of constant freefall, and they're falling along a curved path. And that curved path is a result of curving space-time. And uh, that particular curved path is calculated in such a way that it curves onto itself, so right. you're orbiting. Right. So it has to be cruising at a certain speed. So once you get it at that cruising speed, you turn off the engines. <laughs> but yeah, to be able to visualize at the beginning of the 20th century, mm -hmm. That not you know that free falling in 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 curved space time. Mm -hmm. Boy, the human mind is capable of things. I mean, some mm -hmm. of that is uh, constructing thought experiments that collide with our understanding of reality. Mm. Maybe in the collisions and the contradictions, you try to think of extreme thought experiments that that uh, exacerbate that contradiction and see like, okay, what is actually, is there another model that can incorporate this? But to be able to do that, I mean, it's it's kind of inspiring because, you know, there's probably another general relativity out there. Mm, yeah. In all, not just in physics, in all lines of work, in all scientific mm. pursuits. There's certain theories where you're like, okay, I just explained like a big, elephant in the room here mm -hmm. that everybody just kind of didn't even think about. Right. Like there could be, uh, mm. for stuff we know about in physics, there could be stuff like that for the origin of life on Earth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everyone's like, yeah, okay. Everyone's <laughs> like in polite companies like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Somehow mm -hmm. it started. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> Nobody knows. I find it wild that that's so elusive. Yeah, it's it's strange. In the lab, it's you can't strange replicate. That it's so elusive. I think it's a general relativity thing. There's going mm -hmm. to be something. Mm -hmm. It's going to involve aliens and wormholes and, <laughs> and dimensions that we don't quite understand, mm -hmm. or some some field that's bigger than like. It, it's possible, maybe not. It's possible that it has. It's a field that is different. That will feel fundamentally different from chemistry and biology. Mm -hmm. It'll be maybe through physics again. Maybe the key to the origin of life is in physics. And the same there, it's like a, a weird neighbor is consciousness. Mm -hmm. It's like, all right. A weird every, neighbor, yeah. <laughs> it's like, every, okay, so we all know that life started on Earth somehow. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows how. Mm -hmm. We all know that we're conscious. We have a subjective experience of things. Nobody In understands that. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> the people have ideas and so on. Right. But it's such a dark mm. sort of, we're entering a dark room where a bunch of people are whispering about like, hey, what's in this room? But nobody nobody has a effing clue. Mm -hmm. So, And then somebody comes along with a general relativity kind of conception where like reconceives everything. And you're like, ah. Oh. It's like a watershed moment. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. there. And until- It's there. We're living in the, <laughs> we're living in a time until that theory comes along. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it'll be obvious in retrospect, yeah. but right now we're- Right. Well, this, it was obvious to no one <laughs> that space time was curved, but even Newton understood something wasn't right. So he knew there was something missing. And I think that's always fascinating when we're in a situation where we're pressure testing our own ideas. He did something remarkable, Newton did, with his theory of gravity, just understanding that the same phenomenon was at work with the Earth around the sun as the apple falling from the tree, that's insane. That's a huge leap. Understanding that mass, inertial mass, what makes something hard to push around, is the same thing that feels gravity, in, at least in the Newtonian picture in that simple way. Um, unbelievable leap, absolutely genius. But he didn't like that the apple fell from the tree even though the earth wasn't touching it. Yeah, the action and the distance thing. The action at a distance thing. That is weird too. Well, but that is a really it, weird one. It's really weird. But see, Einstein solves that. Relativity solves that because it says the earth created the curve in space. The apple wants to fall freely along it. The problem is the tree's in the way. And the tree's the problem. The tree's actually accelerating the apple, it's keeping it away from its natural state of weightlessness in a gravitational field. And as soon as the tree lets go of it, the apple will simply fall along the curve that exists. I would I would love it if somebody went back to Newton's time 
and told him all this. Probably some <laughs> like some like hippie would be like, it, "It's a <laughs> gravity is just the curvature in space time, man." I wonder if he would be able to. I don't think there's you know every idea has its time. He might not. He might not even be able to load that in. Hmm. I, I mean that sometimes even the greatest geniuses. I mean you can't. Mm, like you need too out of context. You need to be standing on the shoulders of giants and on the shoulders of those giants and so on. 